The rock looks wrecked, even in its hometown of Newcastle. Deposit guarantees should prevent this, but even after an extraordinary unlimited lending facility granted by the Bank of England and agreed by the Chancellor, customers preferred the sight of real cash. Today's events are frankly unprecedented. This is no dodgy hedge fund or murky private equity company. This is the fifth biggest lender in the fourth biggest economy in the world. And the notion that savers up and down the country would be queuing up to take out their savings is frankly unthinkable, the stuff of financial nightmares, but it's really happening. <laughs> you do if you found out that every credit card loan, every bank loan and every mortgage is a complete and utter fraud. That the banking industry is a huge con, a sham, a travesty of a farce of a sham. That there are an estimated 11.2 million illegal mortgages registered at the land registry and that the insolvent banks that were bailed out by the public didn't have any money to lend. The land was stolen, misappropriated. They have taken what no man should own by birth. The land was stolen, fenced off and gated. Now our lords and ladies hunt their favorite game. Run. The German mercenary is slit throats for the king that pays his penny. Don't pray, the future holds the answer. On the high street, it was business as usual for Bradford and Bingley today. Customers who've become used to bad news on the international markets still seem to have confidence about the security of their local branch. Our story starts some time ago in 1988, when we took out an endowment mortgage with Bradford and Bingley Building Society, as it was known then. We continued paying happily for the next 12 years, approximately, until my wife was informed that we would never pay off our mortgage. And she was quite shocked at this news and contacted me and we contacted the bank manager. They had actually converted our endowment into a part and part, part interest, part capital. He sent my wife, oh, it was a lovely bunch of flowers and a bottle of champagne. We were really pleased. That turned out to be the most expensive flowers and champagne my family's ever had. I'm currently engaged in some court actions against certain banksters. Welcome to the White House. We have an interesting scene. I'm filming right here before our eyes. That have been getting away with fraud on these shores for the best part of three centuries. There are a lot of myths about who might try to get into your house. Everything comes back to what we can count on to be enforced by the courts. We the peaceful inhabitants of the White House. Do you for you all want to have this? All you guys in the other house, you have no things. Any use of violence, from the libel personally? We haven't got a legal system. We've just got a system that upholds the law when the bankster is the claimant. We are opposed as peaceful inhabitants to any use of violence on this street. The law is not being upheld in favour of the mortgagors. This is the law, County Court Act. Okay. This is a copy of the warrant, and that's the receipt. No, we're going, we're going to have the eviction anyway, so oh, it's not going to, we've got a warrant. Today. It can't happen in... You know, oh, I'll read it. Could you read that? Yeah, I've got a problem. Until you properly understand it, you can't properly understand the magnitude of the fraud that has been perpetrated. And also, offences relating to entering and uh, remaining on the property, Criminal Law Act. I need to serve that unto you. Well, we, we're not, we're I not need to serve it unto you. You need to be aware of what you're doing because you can't be breaking yeah, the law just the because you said you're There is, within the law, a remedy for every problem that you currently face 
Only the law isn't being applied. Balance of the debt, the amount of the warrant, and the fee. The total of £110 is being satisfied. There's, there's, the, there's the receipt. There's the receipt. What does it say there? Payment on possession warrant. If we cannot enforce the application of the law through the courts, then the system must be declared null and void. The law of the United Kingdom is being applied in favour of the establishment only. I'm asking all the officers, most respectfully and kindly, to stop trespassing on the property and leave the peaceful inhabitants to live their lives peacefully. But remember, guys, some of you will only be a paycheck or two away from this situation yourself. You don't expect any sympathy from the banks then, because they don't have any sympathy. They are psychotic institutions that are bleeding us all dry. Without exception. Advanced secure entry means basically if you're in your address, you just um, want to do you harm, uh, <coughs> kicking your door in to go in there. I've got no lawful uh, I didn't know to go in there. That's what violent secure entry is. Right. So if now, I've got a warrant to go in there, then obviously then that, that's now uh, what I'm saying to you, sir. Power. What I'm saying to you, sir, if you read this warrant and you actually find out what actually powers it has, and you read that act which governs this payment of this, then you'll find that it's been okay. satisfied, sir. If, the, if you obviously say I'm to prove it. it. hasn't been satisfied. You satisfied the warrant fee. However, if you look on the back, yeah. there's a detail. No, if you look at the details, you find it outside. No, 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 no. We've no, been advised by, right. well, we've been advised you, by no, the judge no, that it's a valid warrant. So. The judge erred in law. And of course, we have the salient fact that I am personally opposed to them using violence to gain entry into my abode. That is wrong. Okay. So what I'm you saying to you, what, what I'm saying to sir, sir, is that there is a dispute here, yes. and you cannot go ahead with this because it's been satisfied. It's the third. You no. cannot just do what they say. They are wrong. It's erred in law. They, they got a warrant and to go into I, the address. They got a warrant. They don't have a warrant. The, the warranty. This is the warrant, and it's been satisfied. Officer, you look quite dangerous. You are here to stop a breach of the peace. Absolutely, and if he's got a warrant to go in there, they, they, they go in. No, no, they're not going in today, sir, because it's, uh, it's actually a miscarriage of just justice. Well, it's not. We have to go see a solicitor and get that sort no, of No, 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 solicitor. No, absolutely not, sir. I made my way to the heart of the British Midlands to meet the man who had challenged the Bradford and Bingley Building Society to prove that it had a valid legal mortgage over his home of 15 years on the grounds that there was no enforceable mortgage contract in existence and the bank had failed to substantiate its alleged losses despite repeated requests. There is justice only when you fight your ground. I initiated legal action, yeah, and I received notice that I was, there was a hearing going to be taking place on the 26th of August at Nottinghamshire County Court. I actually put in an application for an adjournment for, uh, on the grounds that I wanted uh, more time in order to uh, exhaust my administrative remedies. All I found out was that through the woman at the counter that Judge Oliver had, had struck it out on the grounds that it was incoherent and failed to disclose the reason why. I was seeking extra time. Complete bullshit. I was in default at this point. Back in uh, March, I'd, uh, February, I'd written, look, I can't, I can't pay you any monies whilst there's such a massive doubt over the verification of the actual debt. The land was stolen. I was already aware of an obscure case involving similar legal arguments being sustained in a US federal court in 1969, following years of expensive litigation. But to the very best of my knowledge, Michael O'Dara was the first man to take this courageous and groundbreaking position in Her Majesty's courts. 
The last nine years have been spent documenting our mutual struggles against the banksters and those of other pioneering lay litigants, each of whom has presented an entirely valid defense to the crime of mortgage fraud, only to have their claims and counterclaims summarily dismissed by a coterie of judges at almost every level of the judiciary. Don't pray, the future holds the answer for the land was stolen. It's the man on the right, Sir James Crosby, who wrote today's report. During the credit boom years, he was chief executive of the mortgage powerhouse HBOS. Today, his report explains that boom in terms of exotic financial instruments piping hundreds of billions of pounds in foreign funds directly into Britain's mortgage markets. Now the tap's off and the government may need to step in to underpin more than that bank in Newcastle. In the winter of 1999, my parents, my grandma on my mother's side and my dad's friend and solicitor Tim Gray founded a wide discretionary trust for the purposes of building a property portfolio for the benefit of my sister and I and our children. By 2003, the portfolio was valued in excess of £2 million and the trust had no outstanding debts when the trustees were offered a rolling credit facility by Bank of Scotland. Over the next seven years, the trustees used £1.6 million of the £3 million overdraft facility, upon which £1 million was payable in compound interest, making a grand total of £2.6 million claimable by the bank. However, when £2.25 million in sales, deposits and interest payments made by the trustees during that period are deducted, the mortgage money due under the terms of the facility was £350,000. Despite these simple accounting facts, Bank of Scotland Director Willie Sutherland was claiming the trustees owed an extra £2.15 million in entirely fictitious arrears, which was secured by mortgages over every property in the trust portfolio. So if we go back to the period that you were running this bank, or the lion's share of the period you were running this uh, bank, the loans deposit ratio uh, rose sharply, didn't it? So you recognised that you were moving from a secure to a Not less secure basis for funding the bank. Funding less the secure in the sense of access to funding. In the aftermath of the so-called credit crunch in autumn 2008, the UK Parliament issued its now infamously damning report, an accident waiting to happen, following the Parliamentary Select Committee's investigation into the causes of the global financial meltdown. The committee concluded that, as a homegrown banking failure in traditional banking, HBOS stands alone. The HBOS failure was fundamentally one of solvency. From a wholesale funding point of view, we saw, we've. We looked very carefully each year in the planning process at our ability to fund the wholesale funding requirements of the plan, and we saw that fundamentally as a risk to our strategy rather than as a risk to the bank. While you were growing your, uh, this deposit ratio from 141% to 196%, mm -hmm. or on its way to 196%, uh, did you think you were making the bank more secure? No, but I didn't think we were making it materially less secure because of the nature. We believed that that wholesale funding was sustainable. We wouldn't have done it otherwise. This bank had been continuing to trade and they didn't have any money. They were insolvent. What they did have was the mechanics. And they used those mechanics to create purported loans that actually didn't exist. Basically, in the condition I'd set up, I was apt to continue with the terms of the mortgage agreement, provided they gave me the terms of, um, and conditions, a copy of the contract with the signature of both parties on it. The Law of Property Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1989, Section 2. Contracts for sale, etc., of land to be made by signed writing. Subsection 1. A contract for the sale or other disposition of an interest in land can only be made in writing and only by incorporating all the terms which the parties have expressly agreed in one document or where contracts are exchanged in each. Subsection 2. The terms may be incorporated in a document either by being set out in it or by reference to some other document. Subsection 3. The document incorporating the terms 
or where contracts are exchanged, one of the documents incorporating them, but not necessarily the same one, must be signed by or on behalf of each party to the contract. If these original documents are not able to be produced in court, then it all falls apart. There's nothing for the term court. I could summarise your evidence as saying that all banks were hit by this unforeseeable <coughs> tsunami, uh, the financial crisis, with its unique characteristics, which did enormous damage everywhere, and you got hit like the rest of them. No, I think I think that there were, as I say in my evidence, that I think in the that there was, there were clearly in the corporate banking area, um, there there was we were hit worse. And some of that was the mix of assets we had, but some of it was down to um, the, the measurement and judgment around risk. You know, the, and most, the measurement and judgment around risk is, In a, the corporate bank. is a euphemism for mistakes. Yes, but I think that, that I'm quite honest about that in my, in my, in my evidence. And I'm, I, I don't think I would alter and, that now. And incompetence. It was at this point that my dad asked me if I would assist the trustees in making a tender of payment in the form of a promissory note for the purposes of settling the trust accounts. Since we both knew that, in all likelihood, the bank would soon try to steal our family's properties, as we drove to Edinburgh for a meeting with Sutherland, we agreed that we would not back down, no matter what transpired at the meeting. Hey, what are you doing? Well, that's an interesting question, really. I'm just finishing off and um, placing this sign on the wall, which clearly establishes, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that this house here, this home, is sovereign place. Having had no legal training, Michael valiantly presented his substantive case to his honour Judge Inglis in what subsequently became infamous for its fatal defects. Completely discarding the evidence put before the county court, Judge Inglis issued a suspended possession order to the Bradford and Bingley, in which he inexplicably ordered that the bank arrange to pay £300 towards clearing the arrears on the void mortgage account and to resume making monthly repayments. Section 83.1 of the Bills of Exchange Act, 1882. A promissory note is an unconditional promise in writing made by one person to another, signed by the maker, engaging to pay on demand or at a fixed or determinable future time a sum certain in money to or to the order of a specified person or to bearer. In the path of the civil procedurals, I'm seeking an order to make a payment of a security into the court funds office in defence of tender as final settlement of this matter. Me and another guy from Canada helped a guy in Canada deposit a promissory note three days before him and his wife were going to be evicted from their home when they were in their early 60s. And he tried every every remedy that he'd seen on any forum, nothing had worked. I printed off a, a blank promissory note that morning. It's a simple promissory note. He told my friend that he had a uh, a court order to pay the allegedly outstanding balance to the court. I said, right, are you ready to come in? I want to do a presentment, formal presentment of payment uh, to settle and close this matter. And he, at this point, is adamant that he cannot touch the money. We suggested that he make a, a promissory note up made payable to bearer from one of our templates, and he, he adapted it to a ridiculous degree, put all kinds of information he didn't need on it. Miss Foster, on behalf of the lawyer's company, debt collection agency, is permitted to receive payment. It didn't look very good. It had handwriting on it as well because he forgot to do something on it and, and then he, he ran out of, of ink on his printer so he couldn't print it properly. We're going to an interview room at the High Court here for in the Administrative Court and I do a full formal presentment. The, the court clerk looked at it and says, I want to pay the whole thing off. I said, really? All right, OK. Uh, where's the payment? Here it is. The court clerk went. I've never seen one of these before. <laughs> I'll have to go and chat, to go and do some checks if that's okay. He says, yeah, no problem. They, they come in, they sit down opposite, and I just say, well, this, this presentment is, is made in good faith and as a final and full settlement of the alleged amount of it. Being on the phone for about 15, 20 minutes, waiting for someone to come to the phone, he came back and said, uh, yeah, I just bought it somewhere, no problem at all. He's stamped, he is received. And I hand over the promissory now, at which point the barrister it suddenly forgets all that he said before 
steps back and grabs the promissory you note know, from the hands of Miss Foster. Three days later, Royal Bank of Canada, zero balance. I've seen all of the documents, all of them. And he says, What's this? What's this? We can't accept this. This is this is nonsense. It says on here, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of. I'm the bearer. I demand that you pay me £55,000 now. I had the unfortunate occasion in the early 80s to fall foul of Maggie Thatcher's first recession and I ended up being personally bankrupt. At the end of the period of bankruptcy, which was about seven or eight years it took, to be discharged, I set about raising the shortfall that I had, which was about 160,000. And even though at that point in time I didn't have any creditors and I was free as a bird, as they say, I raised that money and I paid off the creditors because I felt the obligation was with me. I had had their money, I used it and I repaid it. The attempt that was made to use the promissory note was an attempt underlined by that background I've explained to gain total control of my situation. And I had every intention of repaying any monies that the bank were out. I was assured and still believe today that they were able to accept that promissory note. Authorities are at pains to describe the deal to create a £30 billion British mortgage giant, likely to be headquartered here in London, as a commercial transaction. But the hand of regulators and government is evident in finding this safe haven for HBOS as its deposits began to leak. Uh, I said, put on the record, are you, um, are you, are you refusing this, this tender of payment? And he said, yeah. By operation of law, the mortgagor's tender of payment in the form of a promissory note made payable to bearer suspends the mortgagee's right to sue for the recovery of the alleged debt, which is discharged under Section 43 of the Bills of Exchange Act in the event that the mortgagee refuses to accept a promissory note for the purposes of redeeming the mortgage account. The judge asked how to look at the promissory note. This is a high court judge. And, he, um, and the barriers had to, it was passed over to him. So he, you know, he held it there and kept it probably for the next four or five minutes. In fact, he had it all the way through his, his summary of the hearing. Lord Denning MR stated in Fielding and Platt Limited v. Selim Najjar in 1969. We have repeatedly said in this court that a bill of exchange or a promissory note is to be treated as cash. It is to be honoured unless there is some good reason for the contrary. <laughs> Having had an extended civil restraint order imposed upon him by Judge Wynne Williams in the High Court, Michael was barred from making any further applications without the permission of Judge Inglis. Several months later, after numerous court appearances, Michael received an order dismissing his application to suspend Inglis's warrant of possession, notifying him that the eviction would proceed on the 21st of June. I got an notarised certificate of protest completed. All, all the documentation that was necessary to prove that the tender of payments had been made. On Friday, by email. There's a copy of the email on the application. And I found all that at the county court in an application to have the warrant suspended on the grounds of the debts of the accept. The county court sent it back on the grounds that there was an extended civil restraining order on there. And I had not sought permission of the judge to award the application. This man that I put in an appeal against that decision. And I just went out there, so now it's on, on the bailiffs, instructed and, and told them effectively that I, I don't care what the court said, but I was regarding this as unlawful warrant on the grounds that the debt has been settled. Just because Nottingham County Court are not prepared to look at the evidence does not mean to say that that isn't the truth. It's my word as well. We can appreciate it. We can appreciate it. We can appreciate it. We can appreciate it. That extra hour until 10 o'clock, until the courts are open and they've received the, the, all, all the details and talked to them. I'll ask you that. We'll, we'll go 
On the 19th of February 2010, the trustees of my family's private property trust tendered payment of a promissory note to Bank of Scotland director Willie Sutherland at the bank's Edinburgh offices. During a four hour meeting, it was carefully explained to him that the bank would discharge the debt it alleged the trustees owed in the event he refused to deposit the note for the purposes of discharging 13 mortgages over the trust's properties with the very specie of payment the bank uses every business day to create credits in its own accounts, which it then pretends to lend to its customers. When the bank refused to accept the tender of payment, a bitter legal dispute arose over its legal department's claim that it did not have the facilities required to accept the deposit of a promissory note, during which the trustees asked for the following things. One, material evidence that there was a legally binding and enforceable mortgage in existence. Two, material evidence that the bank could substantiate substantiate its losses by disclosing the actual bookkeeping entries. 3. Material evidence that the alleged debt had not been legally discharged following several months of seemingly endless correspondence between the parties. The bank issued a statutory demand for immediate repayment and appointed two DTZ employees as LPA receivers who promptly issued notices to the trustees and the tenants of their properties that they had been appointed by the bank purportedly under a power of attorney clause in the mortgage conditions to act in the names of the trustees and seize control of the trust's £3.6 million property portfolio as well as its net rental income of £11,000 per month. The trustees naturally responded in kind by filing a claim of fraud by false representation on the 6th of August 2010, alleging that Bank of Scotland and DTZ were dishonestly claiming entirely fictitious mortgage arrears, that they were relying upon plainly illegal mortgage documents, and that the DTZ receivers, Philip Glenn and Richard Murphy, were therefore illegally appointed by the bank. The claim was finally listed for a summary judgment hearing before His Honour Judge Walton and took place at Newcastle High Court on the 22nd of October when I presented the trustee's case under the limited powers of attorney granted to me by deed under the provisions of the Powers of Attorney Act 1971. After almost 90 minutes of submissions from myself and David Quest, the barrister representing the defendants, Judge Walton retired to consider his verdict. Upon his return, he ruled that the purported mortgage contract was valid and enforced falsely claiming that it was signed by both the trustees and a representative of the bank. Moments after I argued that the document, which was on his desk in front of him, was invalid because it only bore the signatures of the trustees. When I protested his mistake, he shouted me down, telling me that I had had my turn before dismissing the claim as totally without merit and ordering the trustees to pay more than £90,000 in costs to the defendants for a single hearing. Since permission to appeal to another High Court judge was refused, our only recourse was to apply to the Court of Appeal, which we did within 28 days. Three months later, Lloyd LJ dismissed the application as totally without merit, denying us a hearing of the issues raised on the ground that Section 2 of the 1989 Act does not apply to the alleged mortgage contract. With the benefit of hindsight, was this incompetent lending? I don't think it was incompetent in the sense that we always acted, we, we always believed and, and, you know, my colleagues in, corp in the corporate bank always believed that they had a good and clear understanding of the risks they were taking. And we, we in Agri as a bank, had no evidence to, 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 okay. to the contrary. With the benefit of hindsight, was this competent lending? What, was it good lending? That, was it good, a good balance between risk and reward in that sense? Probably not, given the impairments that emerged. With the benefit of hindsight, was this competent lending? 
uh, if comp by competent look if by competent lending we're accepting that the right balance for the benefit of hindsight was struck between risk and reward, then no, so because was, that's the level of so impairment. So it was incompetent it, lending? By that definition. Right. It's your definition. So we thought initially that's a mistake and we'll get it cleared up. We then sent an application to the Court of Appeal to have this looked at. Naively, I felt this, of course, would result in someone saying, there's a mistake here. And we would have gotten that verdict overturned. Right at the very beginning, when, when I realised that the, the points of law, no matter how arguable that I presented to the courts, were not going to be applied, and they were going to be dismissed as totally, totally without merit, I understood from my previous experiences working with Michael, and some other people besides on mortgage issues, that there is a means by which any claim or application to a court can be shut down systematically. When we came into the whole court system, we didn't employ a lawyer, so we were always a litigant in person. So everything that we put forward was essentially not given the weight that it should have been. It's almost like sending the right signal to certain well-placed members of the judiciary, when a legal representative makes an application upon the advice of an expensive barrister to apply to the court to have an application set aside or dismissed as totally without merit, the judge, if he upholds that application, if he grants it, he's obliged to look at whether or not a civil restraint order should be issued. Everything we said was essentially just dismissed as entirely without merit, as though we couldn't possibly know the facts of the situation or be fully aware of the law. The question naturally arises as to whether or not the litigant in person, because it only happens with litigants in person, and it, the, the question arises whether or not that litigant is to be deemed a vexatious litigant. So this automatically puts you on the back foot if you appeal a decision to dismiss the claim or the application is totally without merit. The judge who was overseeing this hearing had no knowledge whatsoever himself about it because he assumed a statement from the bank, a printed statement, was sufficient, which was totally and absolutely inadequate. The arguments were absolutely sound and it was quite obvious from anyone using just the smallest amount of mental capacity to work out whether or not the facts fit the legislation. My parents went through a whole process, it took just under a year, sending out any different notices and paperwork and demands for production of original documents, of an original contract between the two parties, and the accounting to prove that they have actually suffered some kind of financial loss in the extension of uh, some funds towards to my parents. The response received was that the bank doesn't have to tell us anything, that they're not obliged to in disclose any information and simply put, they would just completely refuse to speak to us. Now that's entirely unreasonable. So a very simple request just to make sure that everything is above board because from the outset we have always agreed to pay anything that we actually lawfully owe. My solicitor at the time, back in 1994, I trusted him. He came across to me as a knowledgeable fellow and I thought, right, I've, I can rely on this guy to make sure that everything's genuine and valid. Nineteen years later, I received an email from him in which he confessed to me that, uh, unwittingly that he had, in fact, at the time been working for the bank as well as me. In other words, he was on a commission or a kickback from the bank while simultaneously being paid by me. The sheer scale of the swindle is breathtaking. We continued paying in the belief that they converted our part and part back to an endowment. Sometime later, we discovered that they'd not only converted the endowment into a part and part, but they'd converted the part and part into an interest only. So we complained to the ombudsman. I contracted cancer and the web, numerous operations, and while lying in my sick bed, Bradford and Bingley attempted to possess our home. A week after the first attempted eviction, two more county court bailiffs turned up at Sovereign Place. Whilst Michael was still waiting to hear whether the Court of Appeal had granted his application to stay the warrant of eviction. Well, hopefully, we'll say he'll be sorted out. Hopefully, it will be, and if he thinks we won't see it again, then. <laughs> we have to understand 
the girls in authority, the kind of authority over this, are not always correct. Wrong, you know, wrong decisions get made. Wow. We have rough justice handed out. I could talk through the whole thing about how, how this debt has been discharged. Now everyone is being duped by the system. They don't want us to get our pieces on the chest, so to speak, but if they discover that you are, they're saying, well, this is our game, not yours. How can you figure out how to play it? And we're meant to be tricking you, you're not meant to be able to play. Well, it's like, you know, we've got our little club going now, and you're not a part of it. Just be aware, obviously, the court of appeal doesn't go in your favour. We will obviously have to take possession of the property. So, it's that sort of... Yeah, 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 hopefully it won't come to that. Hopefully it won't come to that. Hopefully it won't come to that. It's a strong debate. OK, so we'll see. We'll go to the other side. OK. The eviction was eventually stayed pending Michael's application to the court of appeal which was heard at the Royal Courts of Justice on the 18th of August, when Mr. Justice Peter Smith refused permission to appeal. This resulted in the county court sending its most infamous bailiff to enforce the warrant. Call the police, you've been assaulted by a bailiff. Right, yeah, ID. Let's have a look. No, it's good, it's ID. So you've you got your hands over it, we haven't seen yeah, anything. Yeah, we've yeah, seen nothing. Yeah, look, you're not blind, are you? Can't yeah. see it when you move. You're a nice man, aren't you? Can you speak to Mr. K? I don't know if Mr. K is here. There's no such person as Mr. Yeah, there is, actually. Excuse me, sir, 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 are you Mr. K? Um, no, yeah. Um, uh, no, are you? I'm so it doesn't matter who he is. You've got a document here to read so before you go. I've got a document here. Well, let's have a look at it then. Right, are you Mr. K? Yeah. You know who you know. So, I know Mr. K. It's because I've just. Do you like this job? Is this your. Do you come and do this often? It's horrible, isn't it? Sure, it is. Like, this is so demon. Sorry. Yeah. It's horrible. This is what we're after. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're soft. 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 You're so what happens when it's your kids or your brother or your mum or yeah, somebody in your family? Throw them out, what happens then? Do you go around no. to their houses and, and oh, throw these people out? Single parents, good. people with kids, people that have got nowhere to go. And you feel good about your job. Yeah? And you're paying the tax, man. Yeah, a bit more war. Come on, you've got to start thinking. We're all human beings together. We've got to start waking up and realising this is all shit. And people like you keeping it going, and it's not your fault, you're doing your job. Yeah, but you've got to think about what your job is. You lot are representing a fictitious entity called the County Court, and look, it don't even exist. We created it, but taking off real people. So if the people created this fictitious entity, how can it be ruling over us? It's like the Matrix. We need machines to make our life better. And uh, this thing that we need to make our life better is some suddenly ruling us. What benefits do you get from doing this? What are your personal benefits? Benefits for doing this? Do you get a, like a, a lump sum or something for everybody you took on the street? How does it work for you? What job satisfaction can you possibly get out of this? So Mr. Kay is not going to. We don't know really. We don't know what's going to happen to you. Pardon? All oh, right. Okay. Come on, don't. Cause all of it. What that is? Is your warrant uh, lawful? No, nothing about this is lawful. You people need to really think about what you're doing, please before it's too late. And don't be arrogant, Mr. Koresh. You really have got a problem there. Former HBOS chief executive, Sir James Crosby, was accused of sacking the firm's head of risk management after he warned that HBOS was growing too fast. And another former employee came forward with his concerns today. Crosby had to resign his current post with the financial regulator. Now, opposition politicians are claiming the government recklessly promoted the Lloyds HBOS deal. I raised uh, issues of uh, cultural indisposition to challenge and a range of other specific issues. Understandably, uh, those were not accepted in certain places uh, with uh, comfort and uh, James Crosby um, dismissed me. I'm sorry that he finds it difficult to admit that he's made a mistake, but I really think he should examine his conscience. There was quite an energetic argument developed in one meeting when the very salient points in the 1989 Act were pushed forward. And I remember Tim Gray's reaction. He said that goes against the principles that all solicitors use. He carried out a procedure that we assumed was the accepted procedure. Didn't in any way think for one minute, and I'm quite sure that Tim himself didn't think for any one minute that the procedure he was using was in any way controversial. If his advice had been genuine, why did he not say to me, hey Mike, before you sign that, I've got to ask you this question. The law states that there has to be a contract signed by all parties. Now, it appears to me that the bank are not prepared to do that. In fact, if you look through any of the documentation you've got, there's not a single signature from anyone at the bank. So they're not prepared to enter into a, a valid contract with you. Do you still want to go ahead with the agreement? Because I've got to say, as your friend and solicitor, I wouldn't touch it with a balance prop. Section 1. Deeds and their execution. Subsection 3. An instrument is validly executed by an individual if and only if it is signed by him in the presence of a witness who attests the signature. It didn't, to be honest, in my opinion, affect his support of the case. Um, I'm quite sure in his head he wondered how the situation could have come about that him, along with many, many thousands of other solicitors had been doing things that were acceptable to, to everyone, but at the same time were clashing with parts of the 1989 Act. The solicitor is like the croupier of the casino. He's dealing out the cards at a rigged table using a marked deck. The documents were all created from, I believe, Edinburgh by the Bank of Scotland. 
produced two Sintons and thereafter, with whatever additions that uh, Tim Gray would have to make, they were forwarded on to me and my wife for signature. None of the signatures of me and my wife were witnessed by anyone actually being carried out. The signatures of the witness came at an, on another day, on another occasion. He is being paid, remember, for his expertise and knowledge in these matters. I would expect him to be able to point out a falsity of the document that he's asking me to sign. You're about to sign this document on the penalty of perjury that you're the beneficial owner of the house. Is that really the case? Because I thought you needed the money to buy the house. I found the original letter that, in which he, he, he stated this. His advice was to sign, in other words, to execute the mortgage deed, have it witnessed and deliver it to him. But whatever I, whatever I did, I should not fill the date in. In other words, I should sign uh, and send to him a witnessed but incomplete mortgage deed. In Scott v Southern Pacific Mortgages, Judge Behrens ruled that a buyer of a property did not have the right to grant an interest over it before they became registered owners, and the seller's sale and leaseback agreement, which preceded the purchase, was held to be void and unenforceable as a result. Remember the letter from Michael's solicitor telling him that he shouldn't fill the date in on the mortgage deed? Giving such advice to mortgagors has long been the common practice of convincing solicitors as has adding the date to the mortgage deed on the day the sale and purchase of a property is completed. Nevertheless, every mortgagor who signed a mortgage deed to a property they didn't own at the date of execution is legally entitled to have their void mortgage removed from the charges register as per Judge Barron's decision in Southern Pacific Mortgages. Well, it was a collusion between Nottinghamshire Police Force and the bailiffs, stroke the court, in that 21 officers um, took part in an operation whereby the local streets were cordoned off and a number of police cars were, and officers were parked up and stood out on the pavement. So it had got to the point whereby they had been defeated effectively through the court system. We tied them in all kinds of knots. And in the last instance, all they had, all they could rely upon was, was criminality and, and force. According to the Ministry of Justice, from 1989 to 2009, an average of 25,000 residential properties were forcibly taken by county court bailiffs following mortgage possession proceedings. Over the past 30 years, at an average of four people per household, three million people many of whom were small children, have been thrown out into the street and left for dead on the orders of Her Majesty's judiciary. You're not down here in one minute. I'm just coming through the door. Having been tipped off that Michael was hosting a party in celebration of his birthday on the evening of November the 3rd, which ended in the early hours of the next morning, David Caress and a phalanx of Nottinghamshire police officers descended upon Sovereign Place just after 8 a.m., whilst Michael and Remy were still in their beds. Actually, commit a breach of the peace 
We will take them away. Well, you're just but me out they are allowed in. Yeah. 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 They are allowed in. Right. We haven't so, served anything on me. I've just told you the warrant. You've seen the warrant. I haven't seen the warrant. You've seen the warrant. Excuse me. I have not seen the warrant. You are surprised. I have not seen, seen the warrant. If you have struck me in coming through I'm this door, I'm not touching you. You will be under arrest. No, you haven't served me any notice. Where's the notice? 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 Where's the you're obstructing no, me. No, where's the notice? And the, you're, you're assaulting me. Oh, I'm not assaulting you, no. You're assaulting me. I'm not assaulting you. Where's the notice? Take your hands off me. Two officers, please. Two officers. You just got me out of here. I'm being arrested. <laughs> Despite the incontrovertible fact that Judge Ingus had ruled that Remy must be given up to two months' notice of the eviction under Section 2 of the Mortgage Repossessions Protection of Tenants etc. Act, the unlawful eviction was violently executed by David Caress, his accomplices from Nottingham County Court, the locksmith who was almost certainly working for the bank, and 21 police officers. Without any notice whatsoever being given to Remy, who was arrested for an alleged breach of the peace. After narrowly escaping being sent to prison for 28 days on completely fallacious grounds, following a disgraceful attempt by Bradford and Bingley's barrister to have him incarcerated on jumped up contempt of court charges until such time that his home had been stolen by bailiffs, Michael had been forced to reside at Sovereign Place as the permanent guest of his housemate, to whom he had granted tenant for life status, which should have provided them both with legal protection. Yeah, you are, Mr. Jay. Yeah, you are, Mr. No, sir. Right. You just sit in here. I'm not talking to anybody. You've got to, you're in the house. Where are we going then? Well, you're causing, I'm not causing an obstruction, all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not causing anything. Why? Because you're getting out. You can't tell me anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. Right. I'm asking you, Mr. K. Who I know you are because I'm the court representing you. I'm here okay. You're not here as a guest. This yeah. is your property. Officers, who's in charge here, please? I am. I don't know who's in the for. I don't identify you. Yes, we have. You have not identified yourself. Well, my first. He is not Mr. Case. I'm asking we bother. Well, I know you bother. Do you do, you, do you not lay a finger on me? I, I, I am going to now. assist you in getting You're not, yourself. I do not require any assistance. Well, you do. But for your safety, I'm in charge of that incorporation. Right, this guy's about to assault me in what is potentially a dangerous position. I am not obstructing, he's allowed to use... Excuse me, sir, this is not a court for this is illegal. It's I'll speak to you from here. I've got this guy. <laughs> No, what is the time you're to back off? You know what, I'm not taking my hand and I am needing to perform. Right, I'm scared. Ah, help me, sir, this is a show. Charlie, get your hands off me. I have not caused a breach of the peace. 
Hold my phone. The camera's in there. Right, hold my phone. Where's your phone? Hold on. Hold on. No, what about all this stuff? Right, you go out in your bare feet. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you, please? Police officer. You've got him shut down. This way. Just come on, you're going to fall, aren't you? You're under arrest. Michael and Remy were held unlawfully in the cells for nine hours before they were both released without charge into the cold November night and they returned to find that their home had been boarded up, the locks changed and all their worldly possessions confiscated. So we decided to have a preemptive strike because we knew what they would try and do. So we took them to court to get their charge of our deeds. As we proceeded, Bradford and Bingley, the solicitors, wanted a hearing to see if my case or claim had merit. And before District Judge Richard McMillan, my claim didn't have any merit. I felt really bad then. What was I thinking about? I'd put this judge to such trouble. And a barrister who came all the way up from London for three and a half thousand pounds. I should have just given them the keys. Whilst Her Majesty's government erroneously claims that there is no specific legal definition of reasonable force, it is defined by West's Encyclopedia of American Law as the amount of force necessary to protect oneself or one's property. Reasonable force is a term associated with defending one's person or property from a violent attack, theft or other type of unlawful aggression. It may be used as a defence in a criminal trial or to defend oneself in a suit alleging tortious conduct. If one uses excessive force or more than the force necessary for such protection, he or she may be considered to have forfeited the right to defence. In other words, anybody, whether they work for the police or Her Majesty's courts, has the right to claim reasonable force unless it can be proven that they had no reason to believe in the heat of the moment that they were subject to unlawful aggression. There is an overwhelming evidence that I have seen that demonstrates that Lord Dennis Stevenson was involved in a conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. In other words, to cover this matter up. And I want to say that clearly. I wouldn't say it on the, on the television if I couldn't prove it. I have mentioned this matter to the most senior people, to Andrew Tyree at the Treasury Select Committee, to the senior investigating officer uh, of the actual fraud, and none of them seem to want to drill down and get to the bottom of it. I am confident that I can prove that Lord Dennis Stevenson, the ex-chairman of HBOS, was involved in one way or the other in a conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. Very serious criminal offence. I was then instructed to present the trustee's case before HHJ Behrens at an ex parte hearing of an application for permission to proceed with the judicial review of the decision of HHJ Walton, which took place in the High Court at Leeds on the 28th of June 2012, following an order by Judge Langan on the 22nd of May striking the application out as vexatious. After I presented the application at the hearing, Arguing that the High Court has the inherent jurisdiction to strike out its own void order, Judge Behrens delivered a judgment he had already prepared without retiring to deliberate. Despite describing my skeleton argument as erudite and containing many authorities in support of carefully prepared arguments, Judge Behrens concluded that the High Court does not have the jurisdiction to put right the wrongdoings of its judges and struck out the application as totally without merit purporting to bar me from bringing any further applications in those particular proceedings. With a fireball of righteous indignation rising in my belly, the judge politely granted me his consent that I make the following statement. As far as I am concerned, a system of justice that does not deliver justice is void ab initio and needs to be struck down. What's truly really bizarre about this banking crisis is that it comes at a time when the economic climate is really quite good. There hasn't been enough to save Northern Rock, and nor does it all go too well for banks that have pursued the same strategy. What we're seeing across the economy is a fundamental repricing of risk upwards. Interest rates paid by mortgage holders, by banks, and by companies are all going up without the Bank of England actually putting them up. That's what the city's really finding scary. KPMG supposedly did an independent investigation into my allegations about HBOS. And that was a cover-up. I'll say it directly to the camera, that was a cover-up. And if you want to sue me for it, come and do so, because I can prove it. 
and it'll be in my book top to tail, so you might as well fess up right now. The trustees took the following courses of action in order to prevent the potential fire sale of the trust's properties at a fraction of their true market value. A common law lien alleging multiple acts of fraud by false representation and trespass with conversion was served upon the LPA receivers, which, along with an application to the county court for an emergency injunction, resulted in the postponement of the properties being illegally disposed of at an auction organised by Keith Pattinson Estate Agents in North Shields. In a remarkable turn of events, the application was immediately transferred to the High Court in Newcastle within only a few minutes of being issued, the day before the auction, when we were told we could present the application ex parte to the judge who dismissed the original claim as totally without merit. Rather unexpectedly, Judge Walton conceded that he may have made a mistake in the original proceedings by falsely stating in his judgment that the purported mortgage contract upon which the bank and the receivers relied was signed by a representative of the bank. He also acknowledged that we had a potential new cause of action, having discovered in February 2013 that one of the registered charges named a registered company as mortgage or instead of the trustees, which we discovered following a routine inspection of the original filing at Durham Land Registry when we also filed AP1 application to have all the illegal mortgages removed from the charges register on the ground that none of the signatures were validly witnessed in breach of section 1-3 of the 1989 Act. Every UK mortgage deed has a section in it, even if it's not in the deed itself, it can be in related conditions, such as this case. Um, the conditions they apply to every mortgage with one deposit of those conditions in the land registry and they apply them to all their mortgages in any given year or for however long they want to apply those conditions. And within those conditions there is a power of attorney that you grant on signature of the mortgage deed to the bank to create and utilise for their own benefit at their sole discretion any document or instrument they choose for the perfection of their security which is about as unconscionable as saying we reserve the right to pay off your debt or alleged debt with your money in your name under power of attorney without disclosing that fact and then come after you for the principal plus interest for the next 25 years. They reserve the right to do it and you've granted it in trust. I mean, seriously, seriously, I, mean, I do not know how they've got away with this so long. I honestly don't. We had all the documentation to, to prove that fraud had taken place. And even if it's not fraud, it's negligence. A young lady, District Judge Murray Smith, presiding, adjourned the case for the possession of my home because she couldn't proceed while the Ombudsman was looking into the case. That the Ombudsman could do anything my complaint was time barred. It was more than six years. And I know there is no time limit to fraud. People didn't give them this permission to do this. Governments, corporations did. I'll not only battle for my family, I will battle for any other family now. They've started a war with me. Well, I've declared war on them. They may win a battle, but they won't win the war. I was unable to get into the house, and over the ensuing months, I put up um, some notices on the outside of the house stating buyer beware, stating in there that to the very best of my knowledge the house had been unlawfully possessed by the bank as there had been no valid uh, contract in place for the mortgage right at the very beginning, which of course was the point that was made at the start of all of this, which was uh, August 2009. So after that, the, the, I, I put my phone number upon this notice. I got rid of one of the local estate agents with the threat of a million pound flat rate charge if they didn't cease and desist immediately from helping the bank to, to, to sell what I regarded as a stolen property. They went, so in the end, the Bradford and Bingley used their in-house estate agency, I think they call Right Move, to sell the property at a much reduced rate. I think it was sold at £62,000, whereas at the time the market value was around £110,000. They sold it to someone who I knew as an acquaintance, a guy called Kerry, who 
unlike the other people who'd been interested in the house, they contacted me, they'd sent me a text, and I'd just basically stated to them, it was a, it was a bigger issue than they realized, and if in, I was in their shoes, I wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. This guy who knew me, Kerry, ignored all that. He didn't even send me a courtesy text to just say, hey, Mike, what's going on? What's the story with this? He went effectively, uh, he was led by his, his greed. He knew that there was a bargain house to be had at a fire sale price, and he went ahead and entered into a, what I can only guess was a criminal mortgage. He's the current occupier. The trustees were then informed by the High Court in Newcastle that a directions hearing had been set for July the 26th and that Norris J, also known as the Vice Chancellor of the County Palatine of Lancaster, would be the presiding judge. Despite the fact that we were entirely unprepared to present the injunction application because we had been told that the hearing was for directions only, Norris aggressively made it plain that he was there to dispense with the applications before the court, his way or the high women's. Four and a half hours later, having delivered the Section 1-3 point, citing the Mercury and Gargilo cases in support, Norris dismissed our application and the Section 1 point as totally without merit and illegally made my name party to the proceedings as a court claimant in breach of Section 12 of the Trustee Act 2000 in order to purport to impose an extended civil restraint order which declared that myself and the trustees were barred from making any applications to the High Court without the permission of Berens. The Bank of England's clear today's action wasn't taken to save Northern Rock but to prevent wider serious economic damage. It's done enough to keep Northern Rock trading normally for now but it looks unlikely to survive as an independent company. For the Bank of England, this is just the beginning of an unprecedented challenge, a tightrope between financial stability and undeserved lifeboat rescues. They didn't have any money. They continued to trade and charge interest to clients for loans that really didn't exist. That brought about a big change of attitude in me. And as much as I have principles, and I will not bend on those principles, when it is turned upside down, I will succeed against this bank. The fraud upon the court claim was served upon the bank and its receivers in the autumn of 2013 seeking to have HHJ Walton's original decision of the 22nd of October 2010 set aside as void on the ground that the defendants, knowingly or recklessly, relied upon the dishonest statements of the receivers in procuring Walton's judgment. Despite acknowledging service and serving notice that they would be vigorously defending the claim, neither the bank or the receivers filed any form of defence, thereby entitling the trustees to default judgment under the civil procedure rules. However, while the trustees were preparing their application, on the 11th of December, HHJ Berens, in an order of the High Court's own motion, struck out the claim on the erroneous ground that the trustees needed his permission to add the bank as a party to the claim under CPR Part 19.4, despite the fact that it was well established at the hearing before Norris on the 26th of July that the claim form which was filed into court only the day before had not been served on either the bank or its receivers, in which case CPR Part 19.4 does not apply. The solicitors acting for the bank and its receivers began to gloat over our seemingly unwinnable position, given that it was unlikely in the extreme that I would be able to present the case for the trustees in any future proceedings. This meant that my 69-year-old dad, a minor's son who left school at 15, had no choice but to present the trustees' defence himself. <laughs> Finally, the bank issued High Court proceedings against the trustees, seeking a declaration that the registered charge over Ashcorn House, albeit made in the wrong name, was still good as a legal mortgage, despite the signatures of the trustees not being witnessed. This is a report that Lloyds never wanted to be made public, but we've obtained a copy, and it's a whistleblowing review of the disastrous HBOS takeover, which saddled Lloyds with debt and led within months to a massive government bailout. In it, the author claims that the banks had evidence of a huge toxic debt pile linked to fraud inside HBOS's Reading branch, which wasn't disclosed to shareholders when Lloyds recommended the merger. 
If it had been, the deal might never have been approved and billions of pounds worth of shareholders and taxpayer funds could have been saved. Three successive chairmen were told about this in detail. A huge number of people wrote to them. And it is quite clear that this report shows that it was known about at board level for 10 years. Anthony Stansfield is the commissioner of Thames Valley Police who drove the successful conviction of six bankers at the heart of the HBOS Reading scandal. He's angry not only that the cost of their crime was hidden during the merger, but also that the whistleblower's report was apparently buried. It is clear that the chairman of Lloyd's, the chief executive, the chief operating officer and their chief counsel were well aware of this internal report in 2013 and I find that it quite extraordinary they continued to deny a fraud had taken place for a further three years in which a very large number of people lost their houses, lost their businesses, lost everything. A hearing of the bank's claim was listed to take place before HHJ Barons at Leeds High Court on July the 21st 2014 by which time the receivers had taken £450,000 in rental income from the trust's properties, which was £100,000 more than the £350,000 claimable by Bank of Scotland at the beginning of the dispute. However, if the mortgages were held to be illegal and void for failing to comply with Sections 1 and 2 of the 1989 Act, or because the deeds were executed before the trustees owned the properties, or because the bank had claimed £2.15 million in entirely fictitious mortgage arrears, the land registry would have no choice but to grant the trustees applications to cancel every mortgage in the charges register, indemnifying the trustees for all the losses incurred. Sleeping in the house for the, the time that I had been with my mum had actually been quite stressful in and of itself because at the time we were taken out on the 7th of January this was the second uh, attempt uh, actually physically removing us from the property so since the first time I was actually removed I was already a bit anxious and nervous and knowing that the tactics the military for instance use when they raid their opposition um, an hour or two before sunrise when they're still not ready and, and fully functioning so I was kind of it was already playing my awareness that um, they could be coming and they will be coming because uh, I knew that they would. On the 7th of January 2014, dozens of tooled up police and high court enforcement officers broke into the Albert's Coventry home before dawn, dragging Ella Albert out of her bed, down the stairs and into the street, causing actual bodily harm. employed by the sheriff's office uh, assaulted me fearing my clothes in the process in every threatening manner and in doing so caused me actual bodily harm and bruising in several places the most severe being along my spine However, it was still an incredible shock. I mean, to have the sound uh, of two petrol cutters grinding away at, uh, first of all, the outer defences that we'd installed after regaining possession of our property, and then the inner defences that I personally welded in, in situ, was just horrific. The adrenaline rush is, is unbelievable, and even speaking about it, recalling the event months on, it's been now eight months since that event, you still get the same do you realise, right, that these bailiffs aren't actually insured? Yeah, you, you don't give a toss, though, do you? No, I feel. No. 
clear from your behaviour, though, isn't it? What, sorry? It's clear from your behaviour. Do you actually think you have local authority here, then? You, you, you think that everything you've, hit, you've done here is fine, you're covered by your paperwork, yeah? Well, you, like, you, guys, you guys have just caused shitloads of criminal damage. You again, what's your name? What is your name? You were here before. Hey, answer your answer. Wait, the last one, sir. Yeah, South African fellow, what's your name? Didn't they kidnap you? Yeah, 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 you did. You're the one that actually assaulted me last time you came into the property, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so what is your name? Yeah. Look. Tell me your name. You have no right wow. to put your hands on anyone. No right to put you your hands on anyone. So I am on my land. This is a declaration, Ella. Yes, I declaration. am on my land. Please look for you. What? She's been left alone. Look, stress the world. Get what are you doing? Get back there, you animal. You just assaulted my mum's wife. You're an wife. animal. Yes, you are. Yes, an animal. An animal. A psychopath. What do you want to fall over? I am not taking your face. Stop the damage. I don't agree with you. I don't understand. I don't need your help. I don't need your help. I don't understand. 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 I don't yeah, you, you guys just stood by while it. someone's been... Do not touch me! Do not touch me! Look at that! You're protecting criminals! Michael, this is mad. What do you want to arrest me? No, 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 because under protest and duress, my mum will be leaving the property. Yes, I am under protest and duress. This is duress. There is, there is no lawful claim. This is corporate Nazi. This is corporate Nazi. We are just following orders. people. Having looked out the window and seen what I'd seen, that being the whole road entirely cut off by police vehicles barricading from one entrance from one side of the road to the other. It was quite clear that they were absolutely intent on taking taking the property. What are you gonna do? Keep doing more and more of this? Whatever the banks say, yeah? No, I'm not on oh, my land. I'm not giving up. This is my land. I paid for it. What else can I say, Michal? Well we are the registered proprietors, the actual I am, owners. I am a demolition registered proprietor in land registry. Sheriff's office, high court enforcement officer. Can you please identify just ID number, anything like that? No. So you're, you're just, you're just basically fed a guy that won't identify himself. And where's the paperwork? Where's the warrant? What's your name? What's your name? Where's the warrant, man? What? Like you like you flashed in my face before, where is the warrant? Show, show, show me the paperwork, you haven't served that guy. Show me the paperwork. Do not touch me, he's out here touching me. He might just get you're assaulted. Get He's touching me. Get you Constable, this lady is being assaulted. She's not. I don't need a thing. You don't have a warrant. Show me the warrant. Show me the warrant. Show me the paperwork. Where's the paperwork? Show us the paperwork. You are behaving like criminals. The audacity to come at such an early time when everyone's asleep, purely just for myself and my mum. So it's not exactly like the frightening arm. You're at the fight club house or anything like that. The logical outcome of this was that I was left without legal recourse. I'd been through the land registry. I'd attempted to to find relief through the courts and it all come to nothing. So I was effectively left without legal recourse in the established system, which had effectively just brought the shutters down on me. Through their miscarriages of justice and by denying me access to that which I was entitled to, the land registry, I was entitled, demonstrably entitled, to have the charge struck out and to be awarded indemnification for the losses that I'd suffered as a consequence of entering into a void mortgage, a, a false document which had been registered at the Land Registry. Under Section 58.1 of the Land Registration Act 2002, a legal presumption arises upon which the Great British Mortgage Swindle's perpetuation is entirely dependent. The section prescribes that any legal estate, including a mortgage or charge, shall be deemed to be vested in the registered proprietor or owner even if it would not otherwise be vested in him for failing to comply with the provisions of the 1989 Act. However, since the only registration requirement of granting a mortgage over any property is that the mortgagor is owner at the time the deed is executed, 
Section 58.2 of the 2002 Act effectively nullifies the mortgagee's right to rely on the fatal presumption that every entry in the charges register is valid merely because it has been registered by the land registry in the event that the mortgagor did not own the property when they executed the mortgage deed. I've got the papers, I've got papers and I want to show you I am a registered proprietor of this property. I'm I'm you can hear me, I'm registered proprietor of this property and you are refusing to sh to see my papers and these people are in my property. I don't know them. They are just strangers. We called the police. Sorry, sorry, say again. There's been an email. Regarding this on the 7th of January. I got told to report to the police station because, you know, the, the, one of these that we did. You do it every day. No, I don't. Yes, you do. I, I don't. I don't do this every day. These are the contents of what used to be in my home, stored obviously separately. Of, no one stores paint with food, right? Um, this is done by. Move Corp, no identification as to who packed it, because this is what they've done, they've smashed plates, they've just thrown everything in, anything that was, <laughs> I don't even think the paint was in the kitchen, but there we go, these people um, behave like animals. Oh no no, I think it's, it's not because it's stolen, it's, wait first of all, would you have actually gotten involved if you knew that there was a high court claim into fraud? That the people who are doing this are doing it fraudulently? Because that, mean, that means you're complicit with those actions. The Look, problem. as I said to you this morning, my Lord, I, I turned up this morning. I, I, I didn't know what was going on. Okay, police is standing and going even away while thieves are stealing our home and our property, basically. And they have no right because they didn't show us any papers and they came 5.30 in the morning while I was asleep, fast asleep. They ripped my trousers and they dragged me from the home, from my home. And they are turning back because they can't face small women. Oh, you see, they are turning, they are turning, they can't, they can't face me. And you could say that I am complicit in that. Well, I mean, yeah, everyone here is complicit. Oh, right. has been here, so unfortunately. And this is corporate fascists, ladies and gentlemen, and police is standing and protecting them. Right, um, well, there, there have been assaults on the 7th uh, of January. No, it hasn't, because I've, I'm only making the complaint to you right now. So you are, you are basically refusing to uh, return. Um, well, well, Nick, in that case, I just wanted to inform you that you have failed uh, your duty, basically, so... All right, never mind, I'm terminating this call, goodbye. Michael Paul Albert, with courage and wisdom beyond his 25 years, presented the defense of his parents, Jersey and Elizabeth, to a possession claim by the bank formerly known as Northern Rock, in a series of hearings before several county and high court judges, each of whom dismissed their applications as totally without merit, despite the fact that the statutory law of mortgages had demonstrably been misapplied. This directly resulted in what can only rightly be considered as a terrorist attack on their home at 5 a.m. on a cold January morning. The ultimate remedy for the British people is to demonstrate beyond doubt in the courts of this rigged game that the rules are only applied selectively. Following their violent eviction from Sovereign Place, Michael and Remy moved into the White House on Stable Street, Mabley, possession of which Kensington Mortgages was seeking from its owner, Sue Brown. Well, sometimes I have to say I do look back with, with regret at what happened, even though it was always the right course of action to take, there were certain regrets I had. 
A little over a year after they were thrown out into the cold and left for dead on the streets of Nottingham, all the Queen's men descended upon Michael and Remy once again, this time to enforce an English possession warrant which had already been discharged by payment. Looking back, I think um, there was more we perhaps could have done to stop the, the eviction on the day. We had every right to use reasonable force as a defence on that day. The receipt is here. Which address? This is the address in question. I'm in front of my house. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? You are about to engage in an act of fraud. What does it mean to say that the birthright of the people of these lands is the law. It means the remedies and protections prescribed by law. You're here to present a breach of the peace and yet you're, 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 you're acting as guard dogs, man. You're acting as guards, a mercenary. If it's not applied correctly by the courts, the courts are in breach of the gigantic trust called the laws of England. Hired guards, you know what I mean, for people that are trying to steal my home. You know, steal the home of the, of, of, of the owner. I live here, it's winter. Under what circumstances can a grand jury be convened? In such circumstances, when any member of the British people has been wronged by the Crown, and wronged includes omissions. The court is not the police, they break the law. You're gonna keep the door open, that's criminal. So when the Crown, or a representative of the Crown, omits to apply the law correctly. Hey, I don't want it coming in. When the law, the correct law, has been duly presented. The banks don't let anybody anything. Hey, this is my house, what are you doing? Those laws must be held to be void. No, 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 no. no. They've got law. The house has been sold. What's going on? Go for a wage. Please! See, because this is about whether or not we go into the system and clean up all the rubbish. In a 
an unprecedented level of resistance to the theft of their home for the second time in little more than a year, Michael and Remy, with seethingly righteous indignation, cutting gallows humour and the vociferous support of a committed band of bankster busters, fatally exposed the criminally excessive extent to which the officers of Nottinghamshire Courts and Constabulary will go to violently enforce the selective application of the law at the cost of the public purse. I think the Turnbull report quite clearly lays out if the main board is aware of major fraud, it has an absolutely legal obligation to declare that fraud and to declare it in rights issues and in audits, and this did not happen. So are you saying that Lloyd's tried to cover it up? Absolutely. There will be a time as my dad made his way to a summary judgment hearing at Leeds High Court, the irrepressible Tom Crawford broadcast an unprecedented call to action on YouTube after receiving notice that he and his wife Sue and their daughter Nicole would be evicted on the 23rd of July. That was very upsetting for my wife. Well, I wasn't too pleased either. I was worse pleased, if there's such a thing, when this turned up at my door. You may recognise him, featured in many evictions. David Caress, an obnoxious, egotistical person. He's not a man. And they say that you can tell a man's soul through his eyes. This man, he's not wearing glasses. You're looking straight into his soul. That evil person takes homes from old people, from sick people, from young people with children with no concern, and his friends. And the county court instigates this. The county court and the banks are complicit in fraud against the people men and women of this country is a genocide against us. The banks don't have any money left, so they're going after the property. During several months of pre-action protocols, the bank's solicitors argued that even if the legal mortgage deed was found to be void, in any event, the bank has the right to create a new charge in the name of the trustees under the power of attorney purportedly granted under the terms of that void mortgage. During the early stages of the summary judgment hearing, the barrister for the bank voluntarily conceded that, in the absence of a standalone properly executed deed which complies with the provisions of the power of attorney Act, the power of attorney clause cannot be enforced. And Judge Behrens then turned to me and he said, Mr. Waff, we have 15 minutes before we rise for lunch. And I said, Judge, I have to say, I am formally asking you to recuse yourself because there is a prejudice in your dealings with my family that I cannot allow to continue. My wife and myself paid. 25 years, we brought out three children in this little home. It's only a small bungalow. It's not worth a lot, not compared to other property, but it's our property. And he said, I am going to refuse to do that. I feel that I have the ability to give unbiased judgment in this case and I am therefore refusing. You have the option of deciding not to continue or you can't continue. And I said, well, on balance, I am not willing to allow a hearing to go forward without our presence. This is a court of record and I have made this request of which you refused. I will rest on that. Since none of the signatures of the trustees on the purported legal mortgages were witnessed at the moment of execution, we have been cogently arguing since February 2013 that each of the documents concerned was void ab initio for failing to comply with the terms of Section 1-3 of the 1989 Act. He had to accede to the counterclaim for summary judgment. 
on the Section 1-3 aspect of Ashcorn House. He said he now had the full picture and it was not possible to deny that judgment. So there is now a state of play where there is a ruling by Judge Berings that the old charge has to be removed. We are currently awaiting that decision from the property chamber to instruct the land registry in Durham to remove that very charge. HHJ Barons handed summary judgment to the trustees, declaring that they are not a stop from relying on the defects in the mortgage deed over Ashcorn House, which was held to be illegal and void under section 52.1 of the Law of Property Act 1925 for failing to comply with section 1.3 of the 1989 Act. The consequence of this original and binding precedent is that every void mortgagor can now rely upon the points established in our case in defense of a fraudulent possession claim in the county court, along with the decision of the property chamber to order the chief land registrar to give effect to our AP1 application to cancel the entry of the void legal mortgage over Ashcorn House in the charges register. Just two days after the summary judgment decision was handed down at Leeds High Court, something truly remarkable happened. More than 300 men, women and children from every corner of the British Isles descended upon Fern Chase in the rotten borough of Nottingham to assist the indomitable Crawford family in successfully resisting another unlawful eviction by David Caress and his accomplices from Nottingham County Court. This film is dedicated to all those who have stood or will stand shoulder to shoulder in this civil war against the banksters. From the bottom of my heart, I salute each and every one of you for your courage. I'm not giving up. This is my land. Tenacity. Never give up. That's the message. Never give up. And self-determination. Let go of me, sir. I don't know who you are. As much as your dignity. You're acting as guards, a uh, mercenary. Compassion. That evil person takes homes from old people, from young people with children. And spirit. Such crimes are being perpetrated by the very individuals entrusted to serve and protect the people. Something has to give. All of which has given birth to an unstoppable grassroots movement that seeks to put an end to institutionalized mortgage fraud and the genocide of eviction. registries. The intention is that one representative brings a representative action in every district registry against every mortgage lender in the country on the same day at the same time. And let's see them get over that. Tom Crawford asked strangers to stand shoulder to shoulder with his family. Those strangers responded in their hundreds. They gathered in front of the house that bailiffs are trying to repossess. A five year long battle over an endowment mortgage in which Tom's bank says he still owes £43,000 and he insists he doesn't owe a penny. I've made a stand against the banks and they don't like it. They're trying to do their best to uh, take this little home because it'll send a message for anybody else who wants to stand up against them. And so it came to pass. The bailiffs arrived, the crowd stood strong, and the bailiffs retreated. Well, I was up there terrified, crying. <laughs> I don't know, it's just really emotional because it's just so scary. It's, um, it just feels so unfair. The Crawfords might be relieved, but the company says it is now considering its next step. The family supporters promise if the bailiffs return, so will they. Now this edge on which I'm standing It gets sharpened every day See, my sword I turned to plowshare Stranger in a strange land. 